Okay, well, let's see if some more people come. But yeah, given the time of the day, I uh, wasn't expecting too many people either. Uh, so I'm, I'll be presenting uh, work I've been working on uh, with my... Oh, I'm Daniel Perez, by the way. I'm a PhD student at Temporal College London. And uh, yeah, the work I'm presenting is a work with my supervisor, Benjamin Livjitz. And it's about uh, basically attacking uh, the EVM using uh, kind of the denial of service attack. So that's more or less uh, what we've been doing, uh, targeted at smart contracts. Uh, so I'll do a brief, very brief recap of uh, smart contracts. Well, I suppose most of you already know more or less uh, what everything about this is. But well, but here we have like this uh, program which is meant to be deployed. Uh, so for Ethereum on the Ethereum blockchain, well, this is written in Solidity and then compiled to uh, some bytecode, which is meant to be executed by the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. This bytecode is sent uh, using a transaction to uh, the Ethereum blockchain. Then the contract gets an address, and using this address, people can uh, communicate with, uh, can in interact with this contract. And the contract can like do all sorts of operations, can communicate with other contracts, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's for like a very brief overview. And uh, well, one of the particularities compared to like most programming models is that uh, we can't allow people to run just forever. We need to like control what people can or cannot run. Uh, otherwise, people could just like stop the network by doing uh, an infinite loop. And for Ethereum, so they use metering or they use the concept of gas, uh, which basically is um, a unit which is associated with each instruction. And there is a, sort of some sort of budget for the program. And when the program exceeds its budget in gas, uh, well, there is an exception, and the program stops. So, using this, basically, we can ensure more or less. We can ensure, well, for sure that uh, every program run on Ethereum will eventually stop. And also, so uh, the send transaction sender needs to pay a fee for each of this uh, gas. So, the fee is the gas cost, which is the sum of all the gas costs for each instruction multiplied by the gas price, which is so a unit of. Um, the amount of money that the sender is ready to pay per unit of gas. And so as the sender has to uh, pay for this fee, he doesn't have much incentive to try to spam the network. And uh, this kind of protects the network against the uh, denial of service attacks. So if everything was working as expected, there wouldn't be any problems. But obviously, this like cost is a bit hard to get right. And therefore, there have been in the past a couple of attacks. Um, so, including like two, the two main ones I think were like in 2016. These two, there's one Xcode size, which was uh, due to the fact that this Xcode size instruction was very underpriced. And uh, as so, the Xcode size is an instruction which gets the uh, size of the code of smart contracts. So it needs to access the storage, so uh, to load, to access the state, and so it's fairly intensive as an operation. Uh, but this was super cheap to execute. It was only 20 gas uh, at the time. And because of this, an attacker just decided to spam the network. And uh, basically, uh, it made the network very, very slow because it took ages to process uh, all these requests. And uh, it delayed uh, the block production and created all sorts of problems on the network. So to fix this, they decided to increase the uh, uh, gas cost of um, Xcode size by an order of magnitude, going from 20 to 700. And uh, there was another issue with the suicide instruction, uh, which is now self-destruct. And well, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's pretty much the same problem. It was very underpriced, and people could basically spam the network. And uh, and then yeah, it slowed down the network. They had to increase the fees and like rev revise a bit how the pricing was done for this instruction too. So in this work, uh, what we wanted to do is to see if now everything's fixed, everything's working, or if uh, well, there were still some issues. So. Um, what we did here is that we uh, first wanted to see more or less how gas was used on uh, Ethereum. So we forked uh, the C++ client called Alice, and we instrumented the CPU to compute basically the clock time for each contract and for each instruction. Uh, we also did the uh, instrumented memory uh, usage, so uh, how much memory ever had had each contract, and what we did is we replayed a couple of months of uh, transactions and recorded each time the CPU used, the memory, the storage used, and the gas uh, which was consumed. So that was uh, what we did, and first we tried to see um, 
the, to look at the correlation between the gas and different resources. And we were thinking that given storage, storage in Ethereum is the most expensive thing, uh, this would be the most correlated, and this was actually the case, so this seemed quite normal. And then we tried to correlate across multiple metrics. So we looked at uh, st correlating storage and memory with uh, the gas cost, and we found that this actually increase, increases uh, the correlation, which was expected. And finally, we also tried to add the CPU uh, as a metric to this correlation. And what we found here is that instead of increasing the correlation, which is what we would have expected, it actually decreased the correlation. So which kind of meant that there is no, there doesn't seem to be any real correlation between the time it takes to execute a contract and um, the actual uh, gas cost. So that was the first uh, kind of finding of this analysis. And uh, with this, we decided to look a bit more into so why this was happening. And so we looked at the instruction uh, which has the highest variance in terms of uh, execution time. So, well, this was also fairly expected, but uh, most of these instructions were depending on the state. So here, if you look on the, at the tables, the balance, S load, and X code size, uh, all required to read from the state. Uh, the other two are not that interesting because it's more dependent on the argument, so usually that's reflected in the gas cost. But for these at least three, usually it's not reflected in the gas cost, but the variance is still very high. So which means that it could be usable to generate slow programs. So then we looked a bit at why this high variance was that high, and so, well, as often for this kind of uh, I.O. related operations, it's due to caching. Uh, so we analyzed uh, how the page cache affected the contract execution time. So what we did here was we generated some uh, random programs and we measured each time the time it took to execute with and without uh, the page cache. And we found that on average, we uh, programs took 28 times longer to execute when, uh, the, when there was nothing in the cache, when the page cache was empty. Uh, so here's basically, so 28 times uh, improvement which is absolutely not reflected in the pricing whatsoever. So from there the idea was more or less to try to uh, find this, some programs which would kind of abuse this mechanism. So uh, we designed so what we call this uh, resource exhaustion attack where uh, the goal is to find uh, programs which minimize the uh, throughput of this contract. So here we define throughput by the amount of gas per second that the Ethereum virtual, virtual machine is able to process. Um, and so basically this can be formulated quite easily as a search problem. So we have this, our search space, which is a set of valid programs. Uh, we have our function to optimize here or to minimize, uh, which is a throughput, so the amount of gas per second consumed. And the only constraint we have is some gas budget. Um, so we basically want out of these programs to find the one which has the lowest throughput. And as we have obviously a very large search space, which is pretty much infinite, uh, we need some optimization algorithm to kind of find this program in a reasonable time. And here we decided to use a genetic algorithm to try to generate these uh, very slow programs. Um, so, what about the programs we try to generate? Basically, there are a couple of constraints we need to make sure we respect. Uh, so, as the search space of, was already very big, uh, one of the constraints was to try to generate programs which are valid um, to avoid increasing the size of this. Uh, and so, valid here means that it can run uh, and be executed by the EVM without running into any exception. So, we need for that to be sure that we always have enough element on the stack. We don't have any stack overflow, so the EVM only has like 1024, I think, uh, a stack of 1024, so we need to not go over this. And we cannot access a random memory locations because this would uh, cost too much gas and it would run out of gas after a couple of instructions. So, this was a couple of um, constraints when generating the programs. And then, as it's a genetic algor algorithm, we needed also to uh, design the crossover and mutation operations so that uh, new, newly created programs were also valid. And finally here, as it was not super relevant to finding slow programs, we decided to leave the loops out of the generation to simplify a bit the process. So this is an overview basically of what we tried to uh, generate. Uh, the details, uh, there's a paper, so for this, uh, the details about the actual generator process are in the paper, but I won't go too uh, much into details here. 
Um, and then another fairly important point when generating these programs is that uh, as our search space is pretty huge, we want to start with an OK solution that we can improve on rather than completely try uh, random values from the beginning and search almost like for too long for, for this to decrease. So what we did here is that we used um, the data we collected in the previous stage. So uh, when we were replaying transactions and recording this uh, gas throughput all the time, we uh, use this to assign for each instruction an average throughput. And then we use the, so this is uh, what I wrote here. So we, we use a simple uh, heuristic to assign a probability, um, a high probability to instruction which has already a low throughput, and uh, on the opposite, a low probability to uh, instruction which are already fairly fast. So we don't want to like completely um, remove them from the generation because sometimes maybe some combination could be slow or so but we still want to uh, prioritize instruction which have a good chance of being uh, of, of being slow so that was for our uh, program construction and program generation uh, and so using this we uh, tried to run our genetic algorithm and uh, so when running this first in our like initial programs or before even starting optimizing using just the heuristic uh, i presented before um, to generate programs, we had on average uh, 3 million gas per second uh, for the first generated programs, which is already six to seven times slower than the 20 million gas per second we got uh, on the same machine when replaying transactions. So that was already a fairly good start. Uh, then we can see on the graph that it decreases fairly quickly at the beginning, and we end up after 50 generations or so at 500,000 gas per second. And uh, finally, so after generation 200, we kind of start plateauing at uh, 1,000 gas per second. And to give an idea of how bad this is, it's 200 times slower than the average execution speed for these contracts. Uh, so, and this was, so everything here was done on the C++ client. And next we wanted to see if uh, this was just a problem with the C++ client or if it would affect uh, pretty much all the ECRM clients and it could actually be a uh, denial of service attack uh, vector. So we, um, oh, first, sorry. Um, so here, what could be so bad uh, with such slow programs? Well, basically, the main implication for this um, is that, um, well, most nodes would not be able to keep up with the network uh, if the programs were that slow to execute, uh, which would probably uh, reduce uh, block production time and probably so decrease the total network, uh, the throughput of the network. And uh, another issue here, um, an issue, another point here is like the feasibility is fairly high. So uh, because it's very, very cheap to execute this attack, for example, with the results we got on the C++ client, it would cost basically less than $1 to keep nodes out of sync for uh, one block. Uh, which for such an attack on, on a network as big as Ethereum, this is really, really cheap. And uh, there are also a couple of attackers which could be interested, who could be interested into performing such an attack. So uh, first there are like miners who could use this to perform some kind of uh, selfish mining. Basically, if they can manage to delay uh, the time at which the other miners start computing uh, the next block, it can give them an a financial incentive to do so. And they can also include like this kind of nasty transactions for free because they decide of the gas price. It's just a small opportunity cost, opportunity cost for them. And obviously there are other uh, parties hostile to Ethereum who want to uh, attack Ethereum as we have seen before, some other chains doing these sort of things. Um, and so, yeah, overall it seemed to be, um, well, fairly feasible attack and with uh, attackers who could be interested in such a thing. And uh, obviously there are some limitations. So this is more mostly designed at uh, community hardware, but we don't really know like what people run uh, their full nodes on. So uh, we're very unsure how many uh, nodes would actually be affected by such an issue. Um, but nevertheless, we tried uh, in some experiments a couple of um, so a couple of clients and a couple of uh, setups. So our main setup was uh, some. Uh, Google Cloud uh, platform with a reasonable, I think, eight cores and uh, eight, uh, eight gigs of memory. And we tried, so, LS, Parity, and Guess. And what we tried here is basically to execute a whole block filled with this transaction, so 10 million gas, more or less. And uh, obviously, we optimized on the C++ client, so it's the slowest of the three. Uh, and here we get for, so, one block, uh, 93 seconds to execute this whole uh, block of malicious transactions. So given a block is generated every 13 seconds or so in Ethereum, this is completely unreasonable time, and uh, it would never be able to keep up, more or less. 
And uh, on Guess, which is uh, the most popular client, it was also uh, very, very slow. So it took about 75 seconds. And uh, even on Parity, which was the fastest of the three, it was 47 seconds, so which is still uh, way too slow for uh, nodes to keep up. So then we tried also a much more powerful uh, server. So we tried uh, on bare metal with, uh, I, don't, I think, 32 gigs of RAM and uh, 16 cores and something, uh, um, and not virtualized. So even then with Parity, which was the fastest of the three, and even then it was 18 seconds, which is still too slow for most nodes to keep up uh, to uh, the normal production, uh, block production. So we con as it was a fairly, um, well, seems to be a DOS uh, vector. We contacted the Ethereum Foundation. We talked to the security team, um, and um, so they came up with uh, with some fixes, with some improvement to basically uh, counter the main issues with uh, this very slow executing contracts. And when executing the latest version uh, with their patches, the uh, guest uh, client so run now this exact same block in three seconds. So and this is now what's running on the mainnet. So now this attack is uh, mostly secured. Um, and so yeah, so we need a couple of improvement for this because it's obviously uh, fairly important that uh, Ethereum does not get attacked through this kind of. Um, uh, the EVM attack vectors. So for now, what's being done on the short term is mostly uh, increasing the throughput of higher operations. So here throughput is gas per second. So one thing is to increase the gas cost and the other thing is to increase the speed basically. So uh, for the gas cost, usually it's uh, some hard fork uh, with some EIP as we have seen a couple of times. And for the speed, it's mostly finding like smarter data, data structures or way to uh, stores the data so we don't need less uh, IO accesses. That's basically more or less what's being done now. And on the, on the longer term, there are a couple of uh, like a bit longer term goals, like for example, status client is an area of research where the idea is to send the data and the proof of its validity with the transaction so that clients don't need to store that much data. And there is also sharding, which is not a solution directly to this problem, but it does uh, reduce the amount of uh, state that uh, each client needs to uh, keep track of, which uh, obviously helps for uh, these kind of things. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for my talk today. Uh, I'd like to thank also uh, two colleagues from uh, PwC Switzerland, Matthias Egli and Huber uh, Rissoff, who uh, helped a lot with the disclosure process and experiments and uh, the work I've done here. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please. Excellent work. Uh, you have a nice genetic algorithm and that gave you some pathologies. I wonder, <clears throat> obviously everything is dependent on which hardware you're using. So on Google, something different will happen from your home computer or your laptop. Yep. Uh, because you have different hardware sure. uh, cliffs of cache sizes and instruction cache sizes and everything, number of registers, whatever. Yep. Um, do you obviously you found some something crazy and something uh, very interesting, but one wonders: can you do worse? Um, you 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 found a genetic algorithm and you found something crazy, but but there's are, there are limits to genetic algorithm. Maybe do you have any ideas of if if there is something worse? and how you could find it? Uh, to be honest, I'm not, <laughs> I need to give it a try. Obviously, this is quite, uh, well, let's say naive as an approach to generate programs. It's not guided. It's really like just combining, trying to and take the best one and do the next round. We, we're not trying to like guide further by actually like um, putting more, more analysis in what's taking long or like analyzing the cache state or what when we're running. So I'm pretty sure there are some things to be found by using a bit more guided approach to this program generation. But we, we haven't looked at it at all in this work. So it would require quite a bit more work to actually get a better insight of of how promising this could be, but but I'm pretty sure there there are still some things to be found. Yes, thank you. Uh, have you tried to reproduce the exact same generation directly on GET instead of using the C++ implementation and using the result on GET directly using the generic uh, algorithm on? Uh, that's something that yeah I want to do, but uh, right now uh, the implementation is a bit too much uh, too coupled with uh, uh, 
as a C++ client, well, it's research work, so the code is really far from perfect. And it wouldn't be too hard, but it would just be a matter of uh, changing like the kind of fitness of the function to evaluate the, the program to call guess instead of calling uh, the current C++ implementation. So it's something which uh, I also talked to the people uh, developing the Python client of Ethereum who were interested in trying this. So it's something that I do want to do at some point, but I didn't get the time yet to uh, try it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in the paper, you had listed some of the opcodes where you had found issues. And yes. If I remember correctly, it was one of the external loading, maybe X code hash or something like that, plus yep. one of the maybe S, S load. Um, I guess those were the ones which, which were occurring mostly in the generated code. And would you, would you be able to tell us uh, what were, were the, the bugs fixed in Go Ethereum, maybe? Uh, the, uh, what they fixed in the Ethereum client? Yeah. Uh, so basically, in my understanding, what they did is that uh, they keep a kind of uh, flat state of all the contracts uh, so that they, it reduces, basically, they are able now to access uh, the information that they need for this kind of uh, operation instructions. So I think uh, Xcode size, balance, and a couple others. They are able to access this in pretty much constant time on uh, on the disk right now by, keep, by keeping kind of another, uh, another snapshot of only the... Uh, bare minimum information about the contracts that they need and to execute contracts. Do they have the Bloom, Bloom filter, as, yes, well, as you mentioned there? Yes, they also have, I think, a yeah, Bloom filter to uh, discard like, all the requests, which uh, basically all, everything else doesn't exist in, uh, in this state, I think. The, the class of slowdowns, uh, yes. they were all things that we, we had to wait for disk. To come up with, were there any? Are there any other classes of, of that I found atoms? here? No, it was all I/O related, and basically it completely spammed the I/O process. I think I have it here. I don't remember, but uh, yeah, basically the load during the uh, like running this was like yeah, more than ten megabytes per second just to run a contract, and that was basically the main reason for the slowdown. Great. Well, I think uh, we're done for today. Thanks a lot again uh, for this great presentation. Thank you.